Okay, welcome back. Uh, so after you've done all the exercises with Yuli and you're familiar with all the stochastic calculus, uh, we will go to the next level. Uh, I will focus more on the economics and then um, you will see more. But what I want to do now is I want to move away from pure real models and move more to monetary models where money plays a role. And in the first part, you can think of money as a very broad concept. It's anything which say, serves as a safe, of, a safe asset, you know, that's a good store of value. As so money has these roles, it's a unit of account, store of value, a unit and a medium for exchange. Here I focus very much on the store of value aspect. And of course, government bonds are also a store of value. And I would like to understand that and answer certain questions in a framework where people face uh, financial frictions and understand what's the value of government bonds. And there's this puzzles out there, why is the value of government bonds so high given the cash flows? The cash flows are mostly negative. How can it be that it's positive value? How can we understand that? Okay. And in a world where the governments have a lot of debt, this matters a lot no, to understand that. And that's what we would like to uh, go a little bit deeper in. So of course it's related to some uh, a debt sustainability analysis, of course, the government ha might have uh, problems uh, with that. And there are some so-called debt valuation puzzles out there that if you were to look at the fundamentals of the government debt, it should be much less worth than it actually is. Okay? But it has uh, a high market value, and why is that the case? Okay? And then there's the question, how much debt can actually the government still issue? And at what rate can it issue debt? And is there something like a debt laffer curve? So at some point, the value will go down so much that actually by issuing more bonds, you hurt yourself more than your benefit. And the other question is, can the government run a Ponzi scheme? And when can it run a Ponzi scheme? To what extent it can run a Ponzi scheme? And what role does it play that the government debt serves as a safe asset? And then I might ask you, what is a safe asset? And that's what we'd like to, the issue of safe assets has this exorbitant privilege. And can you lose this exorbitant privilege, the safe asset status? And you know, what is actually a safe asset? What's the connection to retrading and so on? I will show what the safe asset is and why it is with the government bond, okay? and not on some other asset, or why it might be uh, on another asset, or jump to another asset. And so and then I would like, to, then at the end, uh, Sebastian will take over and he will say a little bit, if you take this model and then you calibrate a little bit, how would you go about in calibrating that? Okay. And then after I'm done, we have a break. You can recuperate from my presentation. <laughs> and then uh, Sebastian will contrast different monetary models from New Keynesian, this physical theory of the price level aspects, these type of models and uh, and also uh, more models which are more on medium for exchange focused, like monetarist uh, approach. Okay, so that's the plan for the afternoon. Okay, are you ready? <laughs> okay, so here is the first puzzle. I said, okay, government debt uh, is, is valued very highly. So think of a repressive agent. If you have an economy with a repressive agent, your markets are complete, you can aggregate up to a repressive agent. And what is actually the value of the government bond? And the value of the government bond, of course, you have a, a nominal value of the government bond, let's say script B, divided by the price value of the government bond. That's the real value of the government bonds, of all government bonds outstanding. And if the repressive agent holds all the government bonds, what does he get from the government? He gets the primary surpluses, what the government generates. So the government has a deficit or a surplus primary surplus is before you take the interest payments into account, and you get the stream of primary surpluses. Okay. And what do you think for the US, what the average primary surplus is roughly? Well, it's negative these days, right? These days negative, but going looking in the future, does it become positive? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> 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 um, so, and if we go to Japan, what do you think are the primary surpluses? 
I have some figures. So here is the US figure. I should have put the zero line in. So it actually looks pretty good. And it also looks pretty good during the Clinton years. No? There was all this paying back the debt. There was primary surpluses. But I should have made this. Of course, I have to go off the chart. If you go for COVID and all that, it goes really dramatic down. And uh, I take it that uh, you indicated there is not so much hope that it will jump back very quickly. Uh, going forward, of course, it's a forward looking forward. So this is an asset price equation. It's a backwards equation, bringing the future to the present. Uh, doesn't look very positive. And then on top of it, what comes, if it's an asset pricing equation, so we have to, this is my SDF here, the present value with the SDF. You always go into deficits in recessions. No? In recessions, the marginal utility is high. And then you should value these states of the world very highly. No? So deficits, you should value very highly. And surpluses, which are in, in boom phases, where the marginal utility is low, you value it low. So it should be even more take into account. So these primary surpluses using a finance language have positive betas. That means in recessions, uh, they pay out very poorly, negatively. In booms, they pay out perhaps something. Okay? It's not a good hedge. It's an anti-hedge. Okay? You want to have a higher, the discount rate should be even higher. So given that, it is puzzling. And there are some papers out there by Hannah Lustig and others saying, how can this work? Okay. And if you go to Japan, so here's the primary surplus for Japan. Um, that's the primary surplus from 1960 onwards. And I didn't dare to plot beyond that uh, because it goes down further. Uh, there are six years, or six or seven years, where the primary surplus is, is negative, or is positive. Otherwise, it's always negative. So, so that's. That's a key equation, the, the debt valuation equation. And it's also the FTPL equation. What does FTPL stand for? Fiscal yes, exactly. So that's what typically the fiscal theory of the price level does. So that's the FTPL equation. And it doesn't really work, no? And people always say for Japan, the FTPL doesn't work at all, the fiscal theory of the price level. So what we argue, Sebastian and Yuli, there's something missing in this equation. And what's missing? A bubble term, exactly. You want to put a bubble term there. Okay. So you, and that's, that's the bubble term we would like to understand. And where's the bubble term coming from? What drives that? Okay. So if, just to give you a little bit, so of course a bubble can emerge if the interest rate, the real interest rate is smaller than the growth rate. That's related to also some uh, Olivier Blanchard's presidential address and all that. But we have a different uh, thing. But, in, but generally, if you have, do the, if you do the forward iteration of, um, of, of the pricing equation, you get this bubble term here. And generally what happens is that, let's take a situation where the primary surplus is fixed by, let's say, minus 2%. So it's, a, it's always a fraction of GDP it's always fixed. You always have a deficit of 2%. Okay? And if the GDP grows at 3%, let's say, the primary surplus discounted at an interest rate which is smaller than 3%, um, let's say 1%, this would, this would go to minus infinity. Okay? So it's a, it's very small, a very simple economy. You just have a deficit which is proportional to GDP. And G, the economy grows faster than the real interest rate is. And if you discount it at that, let's suppose there's no aggregate risk, this would go to minus infinity. But we know that the real value of the government bond is a, is a finite number. In order to satisfy this equation, it has to be that the bubble term itself has to be plus infinity. So that's minus infinity, and that's plus infinity. And that's not so easy to handle this equation. Now this, this is the most famous monetary equation for the fiscality of the price level. You know, like the quantity equation is for monetarism. This is for the FTPL. That's the FTPL equation. That's the equation, the holy grail. Okay. Um, so what we could do, and what we will do, uh, we say we have to discount not at the risk-free rate, the real risk-free rate, but at some other rate, and we call it R double star. Okay. 
And this R double star, I want to find an R double star which is economically meaningful and also gives me a meaningful interpretation of this bubble term. Okay, so that's this R double star. When I discount for R double star larger than G, I can do that. This term would become some negative, it might still be negative in Japan if, if all the primary surpluses are negative. If I discount it stays negative, but it's at least not minus infinity. And then this term is a positive finite number. And on top of it, uh, this R double star should be a meaningful thing. And what we will argue, it is actually, if we were to put this economy, even though there's no repressive agent in it, but I put in a repressive agent investor, this would be the risk of risk free rate of this repressive agent. Okay. And the second term, this bubble term, rep represents some service flow. Okay, that comes from the safe asset feature. Okay. So that's that's the idea. And the service flow it provides some additional service. And I will talk about this this service. Okay. And that's the safe asset service flow in particular. And so then you ask me what's a safe asset? Okay, and what's a safe asset? I would say a safe asset is like a good friend. Okay. What's a good friend? A good friend indeed is a friend in need. Okay. And a safe asset is round and valuable and liquid and all these things you want when you in when you have some shortfall in your funding. Okay. You have suddenly your car breaks down, you need money. You can use your safe asset to get funding. And that's what a safe asset is. So that's a good friend analogy. So when one needs the funds, and you can have individual shocks, idiosyncratic shocks, and you can have also an aggregate shock. Okay. So, but let's first look at idiosyncratic shocks. So we all of you, you get different shocks. Some of you guys, the car breaks down, for others don't, for the others, the washing machine breaks down, whatever. Or you have a healthcare bill, and others suddenly win the lottery. You know? There's also idiosyncratic shocks. And you want to hold some of the safe asset. If we can have complete markets, we just insure each other. Okay. Whenever I win a lottery, I've written a contract with you that when I win a lottery, I give you half. No? You wished, no? <laughs> uh, uh, but, but let's suppose we cannot write these contracts. Then what you do is to say, I might suffer a negative shock. And for these reasons, I hold some safe asset for precautionary reasons. So the precautionary savings kicks in. And you do this precautionary savings with the safe asset. Okay. Now, that's what a safe asset does. Whenever you, you hold it for precautionary reasons, and you can insure yourself. But what we also argue, when you go in a recession, the disengagement risk is going up. The likelihood that you will be individually unemployed or something happens to you is actually going up. And, and that actually makes this service flow even more valuable in times of crisis, do you see? That's a strange thing. It, in times of crisis, this really gains value. Okay? And that will give us the safe asset. It's also a good hedge because the service flow gains in value. If you have it, it gains value in bad times. Okay. So in that uh, last you don't believe in uh, positive surpluses. Yes. <laughs> in that last paper that you were alluding to earlier, uh, you know they look at including convenience yield to try to close the puzzle, and they say that you can't just keep increasing the convenience yield to close the puzzle more and more because eventually, uh, it, the higher the convenience yield, the higher implied actual uh, real rate of interest, and so. Yeah, do you think that there's some way convenience deals can actually like, close the gap fully and not just part of it? Yeah, I would say this safe asset service flow is, is more than a convenience yield. When you look at convenience yield, it's, a, it's mostly about relaxing the cash in advance constraints, some medium of exchange element, or it is a collateral constraint. Government bonds are better collateral. And I would say these are, and you know, John Cochran would say this is tiny. The safe asset flow is way bigger. Okay. Yeah, but it's, they're saying that no matter how big you make, you can make it infinity and it won't close the gap because there's like some. Sebastian has the answer. Yeah, can I, say something? can I say something about that? So I think M Marcus is right. They had an earlier version where they just looked at convenience. Is it working? At convenience yield measures. I think it should be on. Um, but uh, now they have a new version where they say, suppose 
I guess, influenced by us. Suppose you have a convenience here that you can't measure that affects all values symmetric assets symmetrically. And you are going to see this uh, service flow is going to affect all assets that don't have idiosyncratic risk. Then they say, no matter how high we drive it, we can't explain our puzzle. But what they assume is that the convenience yield has kind of, um, has not a sp specific risk structure. So you are going to see this convenience yield here, if you want to call it that way, is counter cyclical. So it also has this negative beta. And that's something they don't have. And I think that's the reason why this doesn't necessarily work, what they say, in, in our framework. So their, their problem doesn't apply here, necessarily. I think okay. that's the answer. Thanks. So, so again, what's a safe asset? A safe asset in our setting will be something, as Sebastian said, which gains value in bad times. Okay? Because it's more useful. I do more precautionary savings when there's a lot of risk around. And when you're going to go in a recession, there will be more risk around. And the second thing is that what, you, what I will show you in a minute, the intuition, you want to retrade a lot. So some of you get a negative shock. They want to sell, sell a safe asset. Others get a positive shock to buy the safe asset. So there's a lot of retrading going on. So the safe asset has to be an asset which you can easily retrade. Okay? So it should be an asset where there's no asymmetric information on it. So no lemons problems, so no market freezes and stuff like that. So it's typically a debt contract. With, without default risk or very little default risk uh, in order that no one guy has an advant informational advantage over how high is the default risk on something. So that goes, we don't put this in a, mon mon a model, but it justifies why it has to be a debt contract. Okay. <coughs> so do we still get the safe asset appreciating with a negative aggregate shock if it's only a first moment shock? Because I think that pushed people in the region of their utility functions where there's more curvature anyway. Right? With that. Uh, no, you really need the second moment shock. You need the idiosyncratic risk going up in our framework. Okay. So, because that's where the service flow, because you, you value then the safe asset more. Because you, that's the service flow. That's a bubble term expanding, essentially. Yeah, I would think that both parts like make the asset appreciate, but it's really only the it is moment. It is a, the second moment thing. If you switch it off, you couldn't get it. OK, so here's our new asset pricing equation. It's not only discounted cash flows. It's also discounted service flows. And this holds in any incomplete market setting. Uh, like in a Buley model, a Agari model, or the papers I've done with Yuli and uh, Sebastian. And here is the intuition in a very simple way. So there are two guys. Uh, there is Alan and Beth, and they hold a safe asset. And let me just, for example, assume that the cash flows are zero. That there's never any cash flow. And the standard asset pricing would say if cash flow is zero ever, the price of the asset should be zero. No? But it has a service flow. So Ellen and Beth, the cash flow is zero. They have a portfolio of the zero cash flow asset, safe asset, and they have a positive cash flow asset, this blue one. Okay. And then the world is going up or is going down. If the world is going up, uh, Alan's cash flow asset is expanding and Beth's cash flow asset is contracting. Okay. If the world is going down, it's exactly the other way around. Okay. So ideally, if Ellen and Beth could write uh, insurance contract or risk sharing contract with each other, they would ideally like to do that. That's where our friction comes in, in corporate markets. They can't write this contract. Now what they do instead, they say, you know, we hold some of this safe asset. It's useless. It doesn't give us any cash flows. But it is useful if the world goes up, uh, we will swap. So I give you some of the zero cash flow asset in return of this positive cash flow asset. And if the world goes down, we do it the other way around. So this way, uh, now they have a much better insurance. Not, they're not fully insured, but through this trading in the future, they have achieved some partial insurance. Okay. So ex ante, they say, I'm willing to hold for precautionary reasons this safe asset, even though it doesn't pay any cash flows, because it allows us to retrade. We trade in one direction if the world goes up, and the other direction when the world goes down, uh, such that we can, you know, par from an ex ante perspective, be partially insured. Okay. And then the world goes on, it goes up and down, and now up, so it's always useful to have that. And that's where this service flow is coming from. It comes from the retrading. It comes from the fact that you can partially complete the market. Okay. So the markets are incomplete, but through precautionary savings and retrading, you can complete it. Okay. So that's what's going on. 
Of course, there is a, a self-fulfilling component to that. There's another equilibrium where the safe asset has zero cash flows and has zero price. But then I cannot use it for this retrading either, and then I'm back to my old world. So it has a zero price, it's another equilibrium, and it cannot use it for retrading because it cannot use for retrading as zero service flow and zero cash flow, so it has a zero price. But it's more natural to have this positive one. As soon as I have some cash flow on it, then I can attach some service flow uh, to this as well. Okay, so that's essentially what's going on. Then the next kicker is that's your question. If you go in a recession, we assume that this idiosyncratic risk uh, is going up. Okay? So the service flow actually becomes then more valuable. You know? Because I, this retrading, so oh my god, the idiosyncratic risk is so high now, I want to do even more retrading going down the road. And that gives you this negative beta, cap M beta feature. Okay? And that the, both of this has the safe asset element to it that you can actually, through retrading, partially complete the market. And this really becomes valuable in times of crisis. Okay. Now, what does it mean? If the government bond and all these things suddenly become available, the real value goes up. So the nominal value divided by the price level, so the price level has to go down. That's deflation. No? So it's this deflationary pressure coming in. Okay. That's where the inflation comes in. But if the uncertainty goes down, then there's inflationary pressure. Okay. Okay, so that, that's what a safe asset is. Okay, we put all of this in, in what the two Yuli told you about, it's all useful for that. No, it's, it, this is just intuition. Uh, and, and you still want to know what this R double star is, or this C double star. C is this Sohasic discount factor, and we have uh, to think about what is this C double star, this stochastic discount factor, what I call this repetitive agent stochastic discount factor. And for this, it's useful to think about the asset pricing equation or to elicit the service flow term. We have to, th there are two ways you can think about asset pricing. Okay? So one is you say, what's the value of all government bonds or, or any asset? It holds for any asset. Uh, uh, so you have this asset cash flow for the whole issuance of this government bond. You discount with stochastic discount factor, and that's the market cap or the total real value of this thing. Okay? And then you have this bubble term here. And let's suppose all agents are marginal investors. There's nobody at the corner, so just to keep it simple. Uh, that's the buy and hold perspective. That's what we typically do. No? That's, and then if there's no risk, we can just discount by the risk rate if there's no aggregate risk. Now, the alternative perspective is a dynamic trading perspective. Instead of holding a bond, what I will do when I buy a bond and I have a bond, say, oh, whenever I have a negative idiosyncratic shock, I sell. When there's another positive idiosyncratic shock, I buy. And whenever, whatever the sequence will be of my idiosyncratic shocks, I will buy and sell. Whenever I sell, I get a positive cash flow from the selling revenue. Whenever I buy, I have a negative cash flow. Rather than holding the whole thing all the time and sitting on it, I'm actually constantly buying and selling, and I want to price the cash flow from this constantly buying and selling. Okay? By selling, I get something. By buying, I have to pay for it. Okay? So I price that. So that's a cash flow conditional idiosyncratic risk. So let me denote eta i, the share of assets held by agent i. Okay? And so what I do is I squeeze in here this eta i, that's the share of cash flows he gets. And then there's also uh, a trading cash flows. Okay? So he gets, whenever the primary surplus is from the government, he gets a share of it. But also he gets something when he sells it. And he, the trading cash flow is negative if, when he buys it. Okay? It's a little bit, it's more intuition uh, going on. That's essentially what, what we're doing. So we have to, uh, and we price the whole issuance of all government bonds. Okay? That's the same limit here, and that's just uh, this thing, and I have to add it up across all the agents. Okay, that's for for this agent, and that's that's a discounting what this agent does, and then I have to have an integral over all the agents. Okay. Now I do a trick. Okay. I change the integrals. Okay. So I just flip the two integrals. 
I should have written this limit again, so the limit should be still there. And, and then I can, so you can see I have an integral over this, then the asset cash flow, and then I have the trading cash flow here. Okay? But all what I did is I changed the integrals. That's all what I did. Okay? And it has to add up, is it the same thing? No, it's add up the same thing, but now something pops up. That's like the SDF of this individual agent I times the share of this agent I integrated over all the agent I. And I call this max C double star. And that, that's a standard asset pricing equation. Now it's just with a, so I have this asset cash flows and I have this trading cash flows just discounted with this C double star. I just labeled this C double star. And this was my R double star in the earlier slide. Um, and what does this uh, reflect essentially? And why is this, this R double star larger now? It's because these things are negatively correlated. No, C is related to the marginal utility of this agent I. Whenever his share goes down, he is poorer, the marginal utility goes up. Whenever he's richer, ETA goes up, but the marginal utility goes down. So that is a negative co-movement. So the discount factor is lower or discount rate is higher. Okay? And that pushes me the whole thing over G. We can show this pushes over G, the whole thing. And you can think of this thing also as the discount factor or stochastic discount factor of the repressive agent. Okay? And suddenly, there is no bubble term anymore, which is this infinity thing. This is a finite thing, and it's tightly linked to this retrading. Okay, so that's the idea from the safe asset thing. So let me show you why. What is this quasi SDF? So call it this quasi SDF. Um, if you do Lucas asset pricing, or if you have a Lucas economy, and there's only repressive agent, you just take the consumption a stream and you discount it no? and that gives you the value of the whole economy. Okay? If you do that, if you just do the consumption stream, you aggregate all the consumption in the economy and this can then you get the total net worth including the bubble term of this economy. Okay? And that would be the SDF you would use, the C double star SDF. That's why we call it the repressive agent uh, thing. And of course, if you have complete markets, then this, this wealth shares would not move around. No? There would be constants. You bring it outside, and then it would just collapse to, to the one without double star. And that's, you know, it's also a good thing to know that then things without incomplete markets, things would go back to the normal Lucas thing. Now, if you, and that's I think what uh, I think Yuli has shown, if you derive the, the risk-free rate in any of these models, you always get, you know, the risk free rate is the, the time reference rate, rho. Then there's this Ramsey term, you know, so if in the future you will be much more wealthy, you would like to bring some consumption already today. And because we don't have it today, I have to not make you do this, so I have to compensate you with high interest rates. So that's this Ramsey term, the growth rate of consumption, de depending on the one over the IES, intertemporal analysis of substitution. And then there's this precautionary savings terms. But if you have incomplete markets, it's not only the variance of the aggregate consumption, it's also the variance of the idiosyncratic consumption. So if you want to risk free rate, the real risk free rate for the economy in general, you have to add also add this guy here. But if I want this R double star, I have to take this idiosyncratic risk out because it's like the repressive agent thing. Okay? The repressive agent doesn't have idiosyncratic risk. Okay? So that's the intuition. Okay, so let me just say, so the service flow is actually what's underneath the, this, this bubble term in this uh, framework uh, because it allows you this uh, reinsurance. And there's a slight difference in, in Bewley models, you get a similar thing, or Iagari type models. It's just not worked out, it's hidden. Um, but it's mostly about smoothing consumption. In, in the paper I will present now with Yuli and uh, Sebastian, it's about retrading the capital. The shocks come from the capital, it's not the endowment shocks, and you also want to change your portfolio share. Okay? And, uh, 
as I said, you can typically you can see you can show that the risk rate plus the risk premium uh, is smaller than uh, the growth rate of the economy. And then I might say, okay, didn't you learn about transversality conditioning in the first year credit school? What's going on with my transversality condition? Did I violate it? Do you think I violated transversality condition? So transversality condition says uh, it has to hold for each individual optimization problem. No? So typically it applies to all each individual citizen in the economy. And it still holds. But it doesn't say it has to hold at the repressive agent economy. So if you have a repressive agent economy where you can aggregate, but then if it holds at the individual level, it also holds at the repressive agent economy. But if you have incumbent markets, it only holds at the individual level but not as a quasi repressive agent. Okay. It doesn't hold there. Okay. Okay. Um, so because of that, or this is actually what uh, Sebastian was referring to, uh, you know, convenience yield and all this, so we talked about this already. It's, it's a, for a much smaller thing. And the other question is, somebody can run a Ponzi scheme now. Okay, somebody who can reissue this safe asset can run a Ponzi scheme, and and who can? And that's essentially we will ask ourselves, who can run this Ponzi scheme? And we will argue the government can, and not Sebastian, but Sebastian <laughs> he wants to run the Ponzi scheme, <laughs> but the government will fight tooth and nail to take it away from him, uh, to keep it to the government. You want to run it. The Ponzi okay. scheme. <laughs> um, I just had one question, which is, um, I think I'm probably misunderstanding something, but the, there's like this result in Duffy that says that the value of any like trading strategy or insurance strategy has to be zero based upon the SDF. So I'm trying to reconcile how... Because you assume the transversality condition. I see. Okay. So because we're allowing the transversality condition to be violated. I mean, there's a famous paper by Constantinides and Duffy with incumbent markets, yeah. but it's assumed the transversality condition holds. I see. But it, it comes out of the blue. I see. So, but, so the convenience yield is essentially the willingness to pay. Oh, now you change gears? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry, Just sorry. to make sure. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. So the, the convenience yield should reflect the willingness to pay for this service flow, right? Otherwise, so there must be some linkage between like the convenience yield and this bubble term? Yes. So it depends how you define and how you label convenience yield. I could say service flow is everything, and it includes convenience yield. And convenience yield is primarily about collateral, relaxing collateral constraints, or relaxing a cash advance constraint. If you say convenience yield, uh, you take it as broad as it's also this retrading, completing markets, it's also part of convenience yield, then it's our service flow. But then it should show up in the standard measurement of the convenience. Really That's correct. Uh, but it, you also get some of that why you don't see it is because other assets can also give you some of the service flow. Okay. So it could be like economy, like it could it, be all bonds have the, have the convenience yield. All bonds have the convenience yield, but not all of them have this Ponzi scheme privilege. So they have to pay back, they can't roll it over. Okay. So, so the, 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 the issue, who can issue the Ponzi scheme, that's an equilibrium selection thing. There's an equilibrium which says, you government can issue the Ponzi scheme, and Sebastian cannot. Okay? And there's another equilibrium where the Sebastian can issue the Ponzi scheme, but the government cannot. We would argue the government has certain rules and laws to make sure that Sebastian cannot. For example, an insolvency law. So they would say, oh, you, we declare you bankrupt. And so you can't, Sebastian can't run it anymore. But the government, there is no insolvency law against the government. Yeah. Or like another way of enforcing the TBC is to have like a natural like leverage. So for example, yeah, yes. Okay. But, but the government doesn't, you can always say for me, for everybody else it applies, this law, but not for the government itself. Okay, okay so that's how to think about that. Okay, now, Enough of, uh, of uh, the intuition, let's go into the model. I will not go to all the details because Yuli will teach you tomorrow how to solve all of these models. Um, 
So what I will do is I will set up the model where there is this time varying idiosyncratic risk. You know, in recessions, idiosyncratic risk is going up, but then I will switch it off and just solve the money model without time varying idiosyncratic risk. Okay. And then I introduce latest stochastic idiosyncratic risk, and we can also introduce equity issuance and skin in, with the skin, skin in the game. That's what uh, Yuli mentioned briefly too. And in particular, it's flight to safety. When you go in a recession, idiosyncratic risk goes up, and everybody wants to go in the safe asset. This is flight to safety. And we will then go on and calibrate, and, and Sebastian will show some calibration steps. Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure I'm understanding the Ponzi scheme language because, as you pointed out before, if one uses the appropriate stochastic discount factor, it still seems like the transversality condition is holding. So, this doesn't seem to me very different from senior edge from issuing money. And no, it is, it is very similar from senior edge, but you can always issue more and more. So you can just pay back. You never have to pay it back. So that's, you take, so when I use the Ponzi scheme, let's go back to the risk-free rate. You really have to pay as a government. It's a low risk-free rate, which is below G. And you can always then issue some more government bonds. So you, the old government bonds become due, and then you issue another one to pay back the old one, and you should even issue more to buy that. So there are two perspectives. One is you can say, I can issue a bubble, which is a long-term asset, and the bubble sits on this long-term asset. So you never have to pay it back. That's more the bubble perspective. And if you want to get more money, you issue more bubbles of this. If you say, I only issue a short-term bond, then you have to roll it over. And the way I roll it over, I issue a lot of new stuff to pay back the old stuff, and even more uh, to have some extra resources every period. Does this answer your question? Okay. Okay, so here's some, some literature, and I alluded already to this literature and uh, some of that. We will come back to that. So uh, continuous time is uh, always is uh, fancy here. Uh, infinite horizon, one consumption good. Continuum of agents, uh, the operate capital, and there's this time varying uh, idiosyncratic risk, and, uh, and it's an AK production technology. It's like as before. And the trade capital and government bonds, you think about government bonds as a form of a broad meaning of money. You know? and, and later we can do an extension, I won't have time to that. They can also issue some equity claims, some outside equity, but there's always a skin in the game constraint. And then there's a government, the government is, has some exogenous spending rule, and it taxes output and issues nominal bonds. That's the, 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 uh, for my FTPL equation. The financial frictions are there's incubate markets, and agents cannot trade idiosyncratic risk claims. Later, they can trade some of that, but subject to a skin in the game constraint. And the, in the aggregate model with time varying idiosyncratic risk, it's assumed that the volatility of idiosyncratic risk is going up whenever the economy is slowing down. Okay, so when the productivity goes down, idiosyncratic risk goes up. Okay, so here's the model, and you probably are familiar now with that. So we have log utility uh, for this agent I. Here's a time preference rate of rho. Subject to the net worth dynamics, uh, the net worth percentage change is the consumption wealth ratio, because it consumes more, the net worth is going down. And then it gets a real return on the bond. And he gets, and, and theta is the portfolio share he puts in the bond. And 1 minus theta is the portfolio share he puts into his physical capital. Okay? So 1 minus theta puts in, in the physical capital and it gets this excess return. Okay? It depends on the investment rate, like in the morning, uh, and that's the excess return. And that's essentially net worth dynamics. And there's also no Ponzi constraint. So if you pick, pick an equilibrium that in the world of citizens, they are face insolvency law. Okay? Now, each citizen operates his own little company, um, so they produce A times K. This can be time varying. Uh, and then they get some apples, and some of the apples will be planted in the ground to produce more machines. The investment rate is iota. Iota times K is how many apples they put into the ground. Okay? And if, you put, if the investment rate is higher, you will also have a higher growth rate of your 
apples in the ground. Okay? Depreciation of the capital stock. And then there's a shock, an idiosyncratic shock. Okay? So each of you gets your own Brownian. Aren't you proud that each of you gets your own Brownian shocks? So each of you is constantly shocked. In the morning, we had one shock for everybody, the same Brownian. Now we have 60 Brownians. Each guy of you has a Brownian. And you shock based on that. And that's idiosyncratic, so that's why there's a tilde on top. And the sigma tilde is essentially how big this. And this can move around. In recessions, the volatility will be higher. In booms, it will be lower. And then you can buy things from each other, uh, which in aggregate, you, if you are somebody buys, the other one sells. Okay? That will wash out if you look at the returns. Okay? So the friction is you cannot trade claims conditional on these Brownians. Your individual Brownian is yours. You cannot sell off some risk okay? in the first part. What's the aggregate risk? The aggregate risk is that there's an aggregate Brownian. Who has an aggregate Brownian? That's this guy here. The aggregate Brownian is not shocking this guy immediately itself. It is shocking, essentially, this guy. Okay. So for example, uh, the idiosyncratic risk can follow this mean reverting process here. So it shocks it up, and then it drifts back to a long run mean. Okay? So it's like up, but then it drifts back, or goes down and drifts back. So it's like the mean reverting process with this long run mean here. Okay, that's just an example. So that's it's like a Heston model in, in, in fixed income finance. That's uh, something like this. And so the state variable will be actually the amount of idiosyncratic risk. So if there's a lot of idiosyncratic risk, then there's the sigma tilde is high. Everybody faces a lot of shocks. We also assume that then the productivity is lower. So this is a negative relationship with that. It could also be that the government spends more, okay? because in recessions, the government spends more. Or you can also keep this a constant if you want. Okay. So that's the model. It's the same as in the morning, except now everybody has its own Brownian. And the Brownian itself, how Brownian it is, how risky it is, is moving around. That's the aggregate risk in the stochastic way. No? OK. So I haven't told you about the government yet. OK. So if I, if I add up all the capital across all individuals, uh, then there's this capital K. So what's different is that, unlike in the models in the morning, there were, not, there were two sectors. Now it's simplified. It's only one sector. So we're all different, but there's, there's only one sector. There's no experts in households. We're all experts. Aren't you happy that you're all experts now? Um, and so later on, in the I theory or something, we will have a banking sector. So we add a banking sector on top of it. Okay? But for now, this is essentially the I theory without I, without intermediaries. Uh, so it, there's no bank floating around or anything. It's just only these individuals, and they all have their own idiosyncratic shocks. Okay? And so that's, and then we have this government spending. And like in the morning, if you have an AK model, you phrase everything such that everything is scale invariant with respect to the capital stock. So we solve for everything except the capital. We know then the IOTA. And then we, the second state variable, the capital K, we can just figure out ex post. But that makes the whole way to solve the models easier, because we essentially have only one state variable, this exogenous sigma tilde, instead of sigma tilde and K. So a K can be solved in a second step very easily. Okay? So that's why the notation is also this way that uh, you have this G, that's the government expenditures, capital G, you can think of as little G times K. Then there's an output tax on the output. Where everybody who produces apples has to pay 10% of the apples to the government. And, and then the government is also issuing an amount of bonds. This is the nominal value of the bonds. And they grow at the growth rate mu B. That's the newly issued government bonds. Okay? And then the government also pays interest on these bonds. 
And this is not an equilibrium interest rate. It's just nominally what it pays. Okay? In, if you issue reserves, like the central bank is now paying, the Fed is paying interest on reserves. Now can think of this, that's interest payment on reserves. Or the interest payment says, if you issue a bond, they promise you 5% interest. Okay? What I will do today, there's only one type of bond. There are no different types of bonds with different maturity, and you do QE and change the maturity. That's in another paper we can do that. But here's just one type of bond. Um, and so when, when you look at the government budget constraints, so you can think of the tax revenue is this. Tau times A times K, this is the K times A is the total apples produced, tau goes to the government, times the price level, then it becomes the nominal tax revenue. Price level times G times K, this is the nominal expenditure of the government. Okay, so that's the primary surplus of the government is this thing here. In real terms, in nominal terms, is the primary surplus of the government. Okay. Per K, and in real terms, I call it little s. Okay. That's the primary surplus per K, because it's an AK model. I want to do everything per K. Okay. So that's uh, the budget, the primary surplus per unit of K. This is S. Now, I can finance this by issuing more bonds. Okay. But I also have to pay the interest on the old bonds. Okay. So if I promise you 3% interest, I can just say, oh, I issue 3% more bonds and just pay the interest. Okay, that's like this Ponzi thing. Uh, but this is not, uh, I shouldn't have mentioned the Ponzi here. You just issue more bonds in order to pay the interest. What really matters is, do you issue more bonds what you owe in interest? And then you relax this, you can have a high expenditures. So if you have to pay 3% interest, you have to issue 3% more bonds just to pay the interest. But if you issue 4 or 5% more bonds, there's 2% extra left you can use for uh, some relaxing, having the pushing, pushing the expenditures up. Okay. And the government has no, no policy con condition. Okay. Okay. It can run a policy scheme. Okay, are there questions? So I will jump uh, a little bit now because I set up the problem and Yuli went through uh, the solution techniques and I just jumped to the key equations now. So why is it that we want selection? Because you can have the pon no Ponzi constraints. So who can run a Ponzi scheme? could be with you, it could be with Sebastian, it could be with me. So each of that would be a different equilibrium. Or it could be one, you know, we can all do it to some extent. So there's one equilibrium where you can run a Ponzi scheme. That's the one you like, no? Um, then there's one where Sebastian can run a Ponzi scheme. And there's one where the government can run a Ponzi scheme. Now you could say, okay, I have a, an ex-ante move by the government to make a, a law, an insolvency law, then this equilibrium would disappear where Miguel can run a Ponzi scheme. So there would be an equilibrium a refinement argument saying, I have a first stage move where the government passes an insolvency law, both Miguel cannot run a Ponzi scheme anymore. So I'm, I'm just wondering where is this different from what we usually assume because consumers typically can't run Ponzi schemes, I guess, otherwise they'd go... No, you can, you can, okay, you can also assume it if you don't, but strictly speaking, it's, you pick an equilibrium. But we essentially also assume it. We assume that Miguel cannot run a Ponzi scheme. But I don't assume that the government cannot run it. Typically we assume nobody can run a Ponzi scheme. Well, we say Miguel cannot run a Ponzi scheme. Okay. You're still smiling, so it's good. <laughs> uh, this is kind of a minor question, but when we say for the aggregate shocks that you know we have this sort of ornstein ullenbeck process for the variance, that, I mean, ornstein ullenbeck processes, even though they have mean reversion, they can still go negative, right? So, uh, it, yeah, that's, oh, okay. Yes. There's no sigma squared, yes. Yes. So it's, it's when, when this gets closer and closer, this 
the right, volatility right. goes yeah. away. Yeah. So it's like a coxin or some Ross yeah. process. So to not pass your scheme, you have to have the commitment for, for the government to pay back and keep the Ponzi, right? So Second, no, the government doesn't. The government has to commit to. No, the government can commit to pay back right. the, the maturing bonds, but it does mind because it can just issue new bonds. Because I don't believe that all government funds. No, 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 fair enough. Yeah, we think that you have commitment, but would allow yes, yes. So, two answers. One in this model, there's only one government, it's the US government only. Okay. Now, if you have multiple governments, and you can run from US to Germany or something, and then you're competing. You know? And then it might also, this phenomenon might also jump, so suddenly it goes away. So you might lose the safe asset status. So if people don't want to use your government bond anymore to do this retrading, and they jump to another government bond, like an international context, then the safe asset status can go away. And we talk at the end, you know, the whole section dedicated to that. How can this jumping of this bubble phenomenon to another asset, why is it attached to this particular asset, to this particular government bond? And it can go to another one, in particular if you have an international context where they're competing uh, government bonds. Is this answering your question? Uh, that's correct, the competing, but my question was, uh, you have an implicit assumption that the government is committing to Issue That's correct, but it's it's very pleasant for them. It, they don't hate to commit. Like, like we don't have that incentive authority for the government. Maybe the government should not um, do that, and then maybe the government should sign. We assume that the government is like um, benevolent. In yeah, but it, the government is benefiting from the exorbitant privilege. It would be silly to give it up. No. So it's very easy to commit to that because there's. If you give it up, you just lose as a government. So the commitment problem is, is not such a big constraining factor, in a sense. So, uh, intuit intuitively speaking, government running a policy scheme is essentially shifting the debt burden to the next generation. Um, I'm thinking about whether if we introduce, but. No, 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 you don't, there's no next generation. Everybody lives forever. Yeah, but I'm trying to think about if we introduce endogenous growth in Yes, in there's endogenous growth. Is it possible to fix like, the transversality condition? To, to fix uh, what condition? The, the, the violation of the transversality condition. So the transversality condition is not violated. It holds at the individual level, not just at but the aggregate level. Yes. So we don't want to fix it. That's the only way we can sustain this debt level. Uh, of course, what I will tell you, there's still a debt laffer curve, so it's quite limited how much you can do. It's not that there's an infinite amount of debt you can issue. No. So this Ponzi scheme, uh, perhaps the language leads to, a, uh, to the wrong impression that you can actually just let your government debt grow. So there's a limit amount you can do this. There's a strict, uh, and I will go to this when I explain the debt laffer curve. So it's not the case you can just say, okay, I blow up my debt level, because everything will react. The growth rate of the economy is going down and things like that. Um, but you can actually do this also with an OLG model. So you don't. So what's a nice feature about this model is when you go in a recession, the value of the government debt is going up. In an OLG model, you have to say, oh, suddenly the lifespan of people are changing over the recessions, which is very unnatural. So and you will never get this negative beta feature. Okay. But you can, in OLG model, you also can have bubble terms. And OLG typically, if you have this perpetual youth models, transversality condition holds at the individual level, but not at the aggregate levels. Okay, so let me just show you the three key equations. Again, each of us is choosing the investment rate. Uh, that's the iota. That's the same what we did before. And we use the same adjustment cost, this log adjustment cost function. That iota is, is given by this expression here. Then everybody of us has to choose the consumption. Log preferences, 
raw times net worth, how much do you want to consume? Now, if you want to, in aggregate, it's a net worth for all of us. So the total consumption demand is, is just raw times the total net worth in the economy. And how many apples do we have we consume? Yeah, we have produced A times K, but Iota times K we plant in the ground for new trees. And G times K, that's what the government consumes. Okay. So that's, that's our goods market clearing condition. And the total net worth in the economy now is different. Remember what it was in the morning? It was QK times K. Now it's different because we have a bubble too. Bubble is wealth. Okay, so we have these bonds and they have some bubbly wealth. So we have the capital stock times K. So QK is the price of each tree times the number of trees. And then we have the real value of all the government bonds. And I call this QB times K. Again, everything is scaling there with respect to K. So we'll choose the notation that it's everything per unit of K. So the script B over P over the price level is the same thing as, as this QB times K. Okay. I use this uh, different notation here too. So QB times K is the value of all the government bonds and has this public term in it. Okay. But what, what it shows is that if we all hold this government bonds and it's extremely valuable, we attach some wealth to it. And if we, that's where I say you cannot really do it too much because we all feel so wealthy if we hold these government bonds. And does anybody of you hold some treasuries? Nobody? Perhaps indirectly through your bank or something. But let's suppose you hold some treasuries. If the treasuries are worth a lot, you would feel wealthy, you know? And if you feel wealthier, you consume more because raw times your wealth, that's what you consume. So if somebody were to say, okay, you can drive it to infinity, you can't because we would consume too much relative to what we produce. No? So the goods market condition boils down what the value of this, this government bond is. So it's, it's tied down. So that's why this is tied down by the goods market clearing condition alone. So that's, so that's the IOTA, that's the consumption choice, and then goods market clearing condition, and then we have the optimal portfolio choice. The optimal portfolio choice, we have always the Julie's favorite, a martingale, equation, that's like the drift, the two drifts written differently, the drift in the capital over the risk-free bond. So I have now two risky assets because there's also the, the bond is risky. It's a safe asset, but not risk-free because in times of crisis, it expands in value, but the drift of, or the, the expected difference in returns is equal to the risk premium. So in the full model, there's some aggregate risk so there's a price of aggregate risk. That's, you know, where these incredible risk moves around times how much does the price of capital move around? The volatility of the price of capital. And that's minus, that's, you can't see the minus sign. Can you see it behind this line? No, but the, it's it there. <laughs> uh, uh, but the, vo the volatility loading on of the, the QB, you know, that's this guy here, the value of the government bond per unit of K. But I look at the stationary setting only, so let's switch this off, okay? And then there's the idiosyncratic risk times the price of idiosyncratic risk, okay? That was about sigma idiosyncratic because there's tilde. And because I look at the stationary, it's not moving around because the stationary can solve in closed form. And I think it's, it's a very exciting thing to solve in closed form. So what, what's the difference in this? If you hold a, uh, a tree relative to a government bond, if you hold a tree, you get A times K, but government taxes something away from that. I have to plant some new apples, so that's a dividend yield again. Now, if the government is printing a lot of new bonds, okay, then it creates inflation. That actually lowers uh, the, the return on the government bond, the real return on the government bond. And that this difference is then going up. And that's what this excessive printing of government bonds beyond paying the interest. If it just prints to pay interest, then I get it as a bondholder. But if it prints more than paying the interest, it dilutes the bonds. So this becomes lower. So this whole thing, the excess return is going up. So that's the excess return from holding in a steady state from holding the government bonds. And then I have to have this idiosyncratic risk, price of risk, because of log utility, the price of risk is just the volatility of the net worth. 
what's the volatility, idiosyncratic volatility of your net worth? It is sigma tilde times 1 minus theta. 1 minus theta is how much of your wealth you put into this risky stuff. That's the fraction you put in risky, so 1 minus theta times sigma tilde. So that's the volatility of your net worth. With, volatility, with log volatility, that's also your price of risk. Okay? It's also the volatility of uh, uh, the marginal utility minus, minus the volatility of marginal utility. There's no gamma in it because we have log. Gamma is 1. And there's so one sigma comes from that, and another sigma comes from the price of risk with that thing here. Okay. So that's uh, the that's optimal portfolio choice is given from that. And then you put this thing here. That's capital markets clearing condition. So if everybody puts a fraction, theta into the bond and 1 minus theta in, in, uh, in the physical capital. Okay. So that means the value of all the physical capital, so QT, K times K, divided the value of all wealth has to be consistent with the portfolio choice. That's the capital market square condition. Okay. So if everybody puts 60% into the physical capital, then the value of physical capital divided by total wealth has to be uh, its capital market scaling condition. So we have capital market scaling condition, and we have goods market scaling condition, and Moller's law for the bonds over there. Okay. And you can solve it in closed form. So it's the first Ayagari type model you can solve in closed form. So here's the IOTA, the investment rate. Once I have IOTA, I know the, how the, the capital stock evolves. I know the price of a tree. Um, I know the real value of the government bonds. So that's nominal value divided by price level. That's in this other notation in the steady state model. That's given by that. And it's just fantastic. Uh, <laughs> and you can also show, you know, if, uh, if for example, if the government is printing more uh, issues more uh, bonds at a faster rate or issues more money at a faster rate, then actually it will be the case that the real value of the bonds are going down. Because the, the government starts more deficits, prints more bonds, the value of the government bonds is going down. Okay, makes sense. You see that? This goes up, that's a minus sign, this in the denominator, this goes down. The value of the physical capital is going up. Okay, because you tilt your portfolio away from the government bond, the government essentially is taxing bond holdings. Why do you hold bonds in the first place? Just to recap. Hold on a second. Store of value. Store of value. And you want to retrade. If you face a negative shock, you want to have something that you can easily sell. No? So that's why you hold this government bond. But if the government taxes this precautionary savings, and this read rating. So if the government prints bonds at a faster rate, it creates inflation. It makes essentially this activity of partially completing the market more costly. Okay. So what, what each citizen tries to do is that, oh my god, we have these incomplete markets. Let's just use the government bond to complete the market partially at least. And if the government says, oh, that's great. I, do you have these bonds? And then it dilutes the bond at a faster pace. Essentially, the government taxes this extra activity. Okay. And that's where you can see already the Laffer curve coming in. The government issuing more bonds is like a higher tax rate, but then it destroys the underlying value of the bond. Okay. That's the tax base. Okay. And if you do it too much, you destroy your tax base, and that's why you get the Laffer curve. Okay. Okay. So that's, so that's for said, but you can solve the whole thing in closed form, if your sigma tilde is fixed, if it doesn't move around. The sigma tilde moves around. If there's no aggregate shock, that's, that's a closed form solution. And now you can do already comparative static. You can say, OK, if sigma tilde goes up, what happens uh, to the relative value? So if sigma tilde goes up, the, the, the price of the bond is going up. Okay, so if there's more uncertainty, you won't do more precautionary savings, and you would like to have more retrading. So the service flow is going up. And if sigma tilde is going up this way, um, 
what happened with my sigma tilde? It doesn't, oh, here it is. Uh, then uh, the value of the reason is going down. Okay? But you can solve it fully dynamically with this uh, stein ullenberg process with you know, some clock on ross feature to make sure that the volatility doesn't go negative. And you can solve it. So this is like the station distribution of uh, the sigma tilde. And you can see that if you go into high volatility case, you go in a recession, the volatility is going up, the value of the government bond is going up. Okay. But the value of the trees are going down. Okay. How do you call that? Hedge. hedge. Exactly, government bond is a good hedge, and it's also flight to safety. If you go in a risky environment, you, you run into the safe asset. You fly into the safe asset. Okay. So that's what's going on. And you rebalance your portfolio. You see already, if you do monetary things, which is mostly consumption focused, the consumption is also going on there. But there's huge shifts on the portfolio choice. And if you have this run in this flight to safety, that means there is the real value of the government bond is going up. If nothing else is changing, it means the price level is going down. No? There's pressure, deflationary pressure. If you go in the other direction, there will be inflationary pressure. That's where, you know, over the business cycle, you can, what is really driving inflation or deflation? Is it more that suddenly we need more? So how is this different? So if you have a medium of exchange role of emphasis in your monetary policy, then if you go in a recession, you typically have this inflationary pressure because you want to transact fewer goods. No, the number of transactions are going down. GDP is going down. So the demand for money is actually going down. That creates inflationary pressure. Here, the demand for bonds and money is actually going up in recessions because the uncertainty is so much higher. Flight to safety, and that pushes the real value of the government bond up, or put it differently, the price level down. That means uh, deflationary pressure. So it goes exactly in the opposite direction. OK. So how much? Oh, I have half an hour, no? Or, or when oh, are you taking? Um, no, I'm, I'm, I think I have another 10 minutes or something. So this is just, this is just what we did up front, now with more formal letters, with some Greeks. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, this was this buy and hold perspective. This, was, this is my primary surplus now. This is little s times k. That's the total primary surplus with my stochastic discount factor for H and I. They all have the same stochastic discount factor. And this is a bubble term. Okay? And the bubble term is positive, can be positive if the risk free radius is smaller than G. And there's also a risk premium on, on this. So it's a, the risk free, what the government bond, the interest rate in the government bond is the risk free rate plus some risk premium because there's some aggregate risk. No? This can be positive or negative. Okay? What this is R. And this is a dynamic trading perspective. It's exactly the same what we had before, but now you can see the service flow more explicit. So if this is written down as before, and then I swap the integrals again. Remember this swapping the integrals? Then I get this C double star here and here. And this guy here is my service flow. And the service flow is the amount of idiosyncratic risk. So it's, it's the value of the service flow. So it is the squared. So I have log utility, so the price of risk is uh, sigma square, uh, sigma tilde consumption squared, and and then I have another sigma tilde for the risk itself. So one is the price of risk, and the other one is uh, the risk itself. And you can see, I can express this with one minus theta. Theta was a portfolio share I put into the bond. One minus theta is a portfolio share put in capital. And that's my trading, my service flow going on here. Okay. And I mentioned this already that these two guys are negatively correlated, and that's why, uh, you know, this is a discount factor, which is which is lower discount rate. The corresponding discount rate is higher. So going to the picture, again here is the recession, and here is the boom. You know, the, when the risk is high, we're in a recession. And what we depict here, this dashed line here, 
is uh, the value of the government bond per unit of K. Again, it's always per unit of K. And then a split, we split it apart between the expected cash flow, that's this blue thing here, and the expected the value of the service flow, the red thing. The sum of the two is the stashed line. Okay. And what you see if you do standard asset pricing, you would actually uh, say, OK, uh, you have primary surpluses when we're in a boom and primary deficits when we're in a recession. Okay. And it looks like in recessions, when the marginal utility is high, it's negative payoff. In a boom, when the marginal utility is low, it's positive payoff. That pushes the, so the value itself is already negative because mostly we're in a, in a primary deficit. But on top of it, the payoffs come in the wrong time, the wrong covariance term. So this pushes the real value of the government bonds down even further. And that's you know what the others all junk and and in Lustig, they all find it's, how can this be the case? That how the value of the government bond is so high. But we argue the service flow is, is much more dramatic. You know? And the service flow, when the isocratic risk goes up, is exploding in value. Okay? And that pushes the whole beta in the opposite direction. Okay? So when you go in a recession, when you know, output is low and the idiosyncratic risk is high, the government bond appreciates. And that means the beta is negative, the cap M beta is negative, which means you know, the value of this asset it has a, is, a, is a great hedge. And so it doesn't have to give you, it's very valuable even though the cash flow payoff is very low, but it's a great hedge and that's why you value it, for the hedging reasons. So you, you have two times hedging reasons. On the one hand, it allows you this idiosyncratic risk for the retrading, and with respect to the aggregate risk, it also has a hedge. So with respect to the aggregate risk, it's a great hedge. But it starts out as being a safe asset because it gives you this ability to hedge against this idiosyncratic risk. And, and then because it has this feature that idiosyncratic risk is going up, uh, that's assumed feature is going up in recessions, which I think is most natural, uh, it, it also gives this additional kick that it also gives you, it's a good hedge for aggregate risk. So it's a good hedge for idiosyncratic risk, it's a good friend, and it's a good friend for general risk, for if the economy-wide risk. Okay. And then you can just blot these betas uh, directly. Um, yeah, let me, uh, you will cover that. Let me jump over that. So what we do in, uh, in general is then let's, uh, let's generalize the model where now you each run the company, your own company, but so far you couldn't issue any equity. Okay? Now you can issue equity. Each of you has your own idiosyncratic risk, but not 100%. You can only issue, let's say, 30% of your risk. 70% you still have to hold because Otherwise, you don't have any skin in the game. So for moral hazard reasons, you have to hold that. So you can issue some uh, of this equity. And then we put this equity together in a mutual fund. And each of you is holding part of the mutual fund too. Okay? So that's what this equity of the others, so essentially. So it's a continuum of you guys. And of course, you can diversify this, this equity. You diversify this, this, idiosyncratic, this mutual fund is diversifying this idiosyncratic risk away. You can assume it diversified perfectly away or partially there's not perfect diversification, but let's suppose it diversifies the idiosyncratic risk away. Okay? Now what you can show in this model, the model solves the same way as before. You just have to replace the sigma tilde with this chi bar sigma tilde. Okay? That's the chi bar is how much you still have to hold on your own risk. And it's just if let's say what is it, 0.7, 70%. Just replace the sigma tilde with sigma tilde times 0.7, and it's the same solution. Okay. Now, but that's not the interesting part. The interesting part, that's just math. The interesting part is this mutual fund. Does it also have a 
it has no aggregate risk because or no idiosyncratic risk. It, it's all diversified away. No? So this mutual fund, is it also the case that the mutual fund is a safe asset like the government bond? There's no idiosyncratic risk attached to that. And I would make the case that actually it has a positive beta under reasonable parameter constraints. Okay, so how can it, something like the government bond has a negative beta, we value it a lot, and then you have this mutual fund, it has no idiosyncratic risk. And why does this mutual fund have a positive beta? Can you imagine why? It's a little bit tricky. So the intuition is the following. Um. Perhaps uh, if idiosyncratic risk go up, uh, people start disinvesting in their capital stock, and then uh, you reduce productive capabilities, you reduce the return on capital. So that's how the return is reduced in bad times. Yes, so that goes in the right direction, but let me be more specific uh, than that. Uh, so what's going on is that the inside equity, your equity, is not earning the same return as the outside equity. Okay, so when you run your company, you want a certain compensation for this aggregate risk and also for the idiosyncratic risk. No? Now the mutual fund, he doesn't need a compensation for taking on idiosyncratic risk because he diversifies it away. Okay. So if you go to this other papers by here and Krishnamurta, they assume that both inside and outside equity have the same return. We don't make this assumption. Here it is the case that the mutual fund said, I diversify this kind of risk away, and hence I'm willing to take it even for lower expected return. Okay. Now, then the mutual fund doesn't get this inside equity idiosyncratic risk premium. Okay. Now, what happens if you go in a recession? When you go in a recession, idiosyncratic risk is going up. Now, the company is not producing more. That's what your argument is. But the company has to say, okay, some of this extra what I produce goes to the inside equity holder, the guy who runs the company, and some goes to this outside equity holder, which goes to the mutual fund. But suddenly, this kind of risk is going up, and this kind of risk going up means the guy who runs the company has to bear this kind of risk. He wants a higher compensation. So there's less left for the outside equity holders. And the outside equity holders, they don't have this high kind of risk. They don't need more, but they have now less left for the outside equity holders. And of course, the company will shrink to it, will scale back in all this in equilibrium. But there's a, a decline what actually the outside equity holders get, okay? because they need more for the inside equity holders. And that means when you go in a recession, there's less uh, for the outside equity holder for this mutual fund. And that shows it gives you a positive beta, okay? because it actually there's lower dividend this mutual fund can generate because it earns less from its own holdings. Okay. And that's why uh, this ETF or this mutual fund still can have a positive beta. So it's, it might be also a good friend in terms of idiosyncratic risk, but it's a bad friend for the aggregate risk. Okay. Okay, of course, for this to work, it has to be a sufficiently big this effect uh, to offset uh, one from the other. Okay. But just to give you. Um, now, let me link to this uh, papers by Zhang, Lustig, von Nürburgring, and uh, Chialon. Um, there are two public debt valuation puzzles. So essentially, why is it the case that the government bonds are so valued, so highly valued? And they argue, you know, the average surplus is roughly zero, and at, on top of it, it's a bad hedge. Okay. And we would argue, no, because there is a bubble on it. And actually, once the bubble, the bubble itself makes it a good hedge because the bubble expands in bad times. So it makes it a good hedge. But they have a second argument, which is a more subtle argument. They say, okay, if you don't have a bubble, you can either insure the taxpayer or you can insure the bondholders. Okay, so what do they mean by that? Um, let's suppose. We go into bad times, cash flows are going down. Uh, you can say to the bondholders, I have to issue more debt right now because we go in a recession. 
primary surplus will be more negative. Okay? That means it's a very bad, the chronic government bonds are bad insurance for the bondholders. But it's okay for the taxpayers uh, because I can cut taxes. I go in a recession, I cut taxes, I stimulate the economy, I go into huge primary deficits. It's bad for the bondholders, but it protects the taxpayers. Okay? Or I can do the alternative. I can say, okay, we go in a recession, we leave the primary surpluses, we don't uh, have a bad asset for the, the, the bond bondholders, but I go in austerity measures, and it's bad for the taxpayers. Okay, so you can either be pro cyclical with the taxpayers or with the bondholders. But this is a lack of money, the Miller argument, you can't give it to both. You can either be a good insurance instrument for the bondholders or for the taxpayers. But you can't give it to both. Okay. Now, in our framework, you can give it to both. Okay. You can just, you know, because in times of crisis, the service flow value, this value of the service flow is just going up. So there's extra room. So you can actually provide a good insurance to the bondholders and to some extent also to the taxpayers. Okay. So you tr treat it cyclically uh, differently. Now, let me conclude with a uh, dead Laffer curve, or, or perhaps uh, one more thing. Let me first say the dead Laffer curve. Now, you might say, can you generate government debt more and more? And, you, know, there's, you run a Ponzi scheme without limits. And we would say, no, no, you can't do that, because the value of the government bonds is wealth for the, for the citizens. And if the citizens feel more wealthy, then they consume more, and then you don't have enough apples to consume, so it doesn't work. Okay. So if you print more bonds, you just dilute the value of the bonds, and then the inflation kicks in. So what you do is, if you issue more bonds, it's if you issue, essentially you create an inflation tax. You tax the bondholders. So and how much revenue can a government gen generate depends if you raise uh, how many bonds you print, it raises the inflation tax, of course the government gets more revenue from that. But you, di you dilute the value of the government bond, and the value of the government bond is the tax base. And that's, you see, the tax rate goes up, you get the tax revenue goes up, but the tax base goes down, the revenue kick goes down. And that gives you this Laffer curve, uh, what I've depicted here. So what's interesting though, is that, and I didn't uh, depict here, the actual lever curve, if you don't have this aggregate risk, would be something like that. Do you see it? How can you see it? It's not even on the slides. Uh, and so it's so small, you don't see it much. But if, uh, if we have this negative beta, it gives you a much bigger kick. So the negative beta it quantitatively makes a huge difference. So the, the negative beta gives you this extra kick. Without this negative beta, beta, it's tiny, this effect. So there's almost no wiggle room. But it's actually this negative beta which gives you, where can the government can say, I issue a bond which is not only a bubble, but a bubble which expands in times of crisis. That's really, and, and few government can do that. It has to be the flight to safety asset. And many emerging economies don't have this exorbitant privilege. Okay, there's only certain economies have that. And that's why the next, the final thing is, this exorbitant privilege is essentially, a, has a bubbly feature to it, it's self-fulfilling, and it can pop, bubbles can pop, okay, it can go away. And uh, that's why, you know, you have to watch out and you have to protect it. And that has implications for debt sustainability analysis. It means you have to have room to defend the bubble. So how do you defend the bubble? Uh, you say, if the bubble were to pop, I raise taxes and create primary surplus and defend it. I only have to do it off equilibrium. I have to be credible that I can do that. So I need to have enough fiscal space to raise taxes if ever would be necessary to defend my bubble. So if the US can say, if the political system is stable enough, the US could always say, we introduce a value added tax of 20%. No, the US doesn't have any value added tax. That could just impose 20, I mean, it would be a huge outcry, but you could protect in theory. And as long as the market believes you could do it, they will not attack a bubble. Okay? 
But that's enough. Just off equilibrium, you have to have the capacity. If you don't have the capacity, you're always at the danger you, you lose with the safety status. Okay. And that, that gives you but gives you a different perspective. It's, it's really to be able to defend this exorbitant privilege. That's what has to be a different mindset of uh, debt sustainability analysis. Because if you do the standard debt sustainability analysis, you always say the US is not even sustainable. Okay? And you have to think differently about that. And the other thing is, you know what happened in March 2020, the US Treasury was not trading anymore. And it was essentially the market, the Treasury market was collapsing because the market making didn't work. So for this retrading, it's important that you can easily retrade it back and forth. Okay? So you need a low bid ask spread, so you also want to act as a market maker of last resort as a central bank occasionally. So if the market breaks down, you want to make sure the market is functioning. Okay, the market functioning, and you don't want to have any asymmetric information on this asset. Okay, that's very important. And, and I mentioned already why is the bubble on the government debt, uh, and that's very much you know has to do with insolvency law and other things. Why is it not jumping to crypto assets? So one interesting question is, are we have now Bitcoin? Will this exorbitant privilege go from government debt into Bitcoin? It's another nice bubble and it might jump to some extent. And how can you, through regulation, make sure it is not jumping? And if you're a government, you think about it, or is it jumping to some other crypto asset or something? How should it defend that? And that's where we go to this digital money issues, okay? So that's uh, that a lot of interesting issues once you think in this way. Um, so let me conclude. What's a safe asset? It's a good friend. It's a good friend individually for your own individual shocks, for idiosyncratic shocks, it allows you to self-insure against idiosyncratic risk. And it's good for aggregate shocks because in times of crisis, individual shocks go higher and then you value this, everybody values it higher. So it's actually an asset which appreciates in times of crisis. And the service flow is much bigger than the traditional convenience yield thing, which is you know, just some spread showing up between BAA and treasuries. No, no, this is a much bigger component coming from the retrading and it is also sitting on other assets. So when you just look at the spread, you don't capture that. Um, and there's this flight to safety. In times of crisis, you fly into this and large mutual funds don't have that because they also the, the cash flow is going down. And it has impl important implications for debt sustainability analysis. And I will now pause on for the remaining, I don't know, uh, 10 or 15 minutes uh, in two minutes. Uh, <laughs> um, I pass on the, the control to Sebastian. He will show you a little bit how to go beyond the model and also perhaps uh, one slide or two about the calibration, how you would calibrate such a model. Okay. Thanks. All right. There was another question, right? Yeah, I two so to, to Sebastian or me? Uh, both. Well, both. Even. <laughs> uh, so in the standard IAGARI setup, all the idiosyncratic risk is attached to earnings that has nothing to do with like your savings, your stock of savings, right? And so, and then the return on your savings is just constant across people, maybe not across like aggregate states. If, if that's what's, if that were to be what's going on here, how much, like would the role for the government debt as a precautionary saving asset be diminished if there weren't any idiosyncratic risk in the return of the asset? I think it would be the same. So it's only just, so in Ayagari, just to make the distinction clear, it's, it's always an endowment shock. So here the shock is on the capital stock. Mm -hmm. And the big difference is if you choose, change your portfolio and you invest more in capital, your risk is going up too. Yeah. In Ayagari, your risk is fixed. So if your portfolio choice can be changing, but the risk exposure is fixed. Okay. It just, so the analytics, that's why you can't solve the Agari models in closed form. The, if you make the switch we make it made, then you can solve it in closed form because everything scales up and down. So it's like you 10 times as wealthy as me, you hold 10 times as many risky stocks than me, mm -hmm. your risk is 10 times, everything is 10 times. Mm -hmm. In Agari, we would have the same risk, but you 10 times as wealthy, yeah. you see. And so nothing scales up anymore linearly. So then you can't aggregate it, and that's where you get these huge computational challenges. But the underlying economics would still work the same way. Okay. Okay. So the forces are the same, they're similar. 
It's just hard to tease them out because you can't solve them analytically so well. Okay. Let, me, let me give you another answer. Uh, I think what Marcus says is conceptually or qualitatively correct. But I think if you were to put numbers on things, then probably it would matter quite a bit. Because in Ayagari, what happens, those people that have most idiosyncratic risk are the poor ones that are close to the borrowing constraint. Those are the ones that drive the precautionary savings. But if you think about asset pricing, who holds most the assets? The rich guys. But they and Ayagari have not that much residual idiosyncratic risk relative to wealth left. And relative to wealth is what matters for risk premium. So I think if you were to put this in an Ayagari model literally, you would probably get trouble with the numbers. I'm talking about the numbers in a minute. So you would probably get trouble with the numbers. On the other hand, we also know that these models don't work so well in capturing actually top wealth inequality because exactly they don't have any of these features that people that, that are rich have additional idiosyncratic risk. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, we think that, that this is probably not so unrealistic in this. Okay. There's another thing. If you have an Iagari model, then capital is a safe asset, right? Because capital doesn't have idiosyncratic risk. And there's also not this feature going on that in recessions, insiders want more, uh, want to more compensation, at, and, and therefore uh, the, the compensation to the capital holders goes down. That is also not going on. That means the only way to have a bubble, we don't need a bubble here for having the sa safety feature, but often we do have bubbles. The only way to have a bubble in Iagari is to have something like dynamic inefficiency, that the capital return is so low and the depreciation is so high that actually the, the, the um, interest rate goes falls below the growth rate. So therefore, in, if you think a bit more how to match it kind of to, to what we know about the evidence, I don't think it would work in Iagari so well. But purely conceptually, if you just think about what's going on in the theory, then Marcus is right. The same forces are also in an Iagari model. Okay. Does that make sense? Just small in Iagari. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess this is the competition between the government bond and like the other assets going on. Yeah. Maybe it's just the competition. So here the thing is, the competing asset to government bonds is the capital. And the capital is either some individual guy that holds all this idiosyncratic risk, or it's the stockholders, but there is always some corporate executive or individual guy behind them that wants a higher compensation in recession. So even the stockholders don't really gain from the, from the idiosyncratic catching, risk catching so much because they, they have this, negative beta, uh, this positive beta feature. So that, that's quite a bit different from what you would get in an IAGAR model. OK, so for the remaining few minutes, what I want to do is um, talk a bit about the numbers. And uh, just as a disclaimer, we are all three not really uh, so much number people. So this, um, we, we, we are more theorists. But uh, nevertheless, the question is, if you come up with a nice theory, is this something that's, that's quantitatively plausible? Is this just something that we came up with? Maybe a nice story, but uh, it has nothing to do with reality. So that's why we want try to put some numbers on it. And um, the numbers that Marcus actually showed, or the graph that Marcus showed, are unfortunately not the numbers I'm going to show you now, because this is brand new. This is from yesterday. Therefore, the slides are also not so uh, polished yet. And if you have any comments to what I tell you, it would be very appreciated, because it may be that, that what we are doing doesn't make so much sense. I mean, we ho it, I hope it does. But you know, if you do have any comments, now is the right time to tell us. So what we are doing is the following. We want to bring this not to a lot of data, but to a bit of aggregate data on asset prices and on, say, business cycle variation. And the first thing we are doing is we change the model. Because if you take the model literally how Marcus has presented it, it will be very hard to match risk premium. We know the equity premium is very large. Log utility just doesn't give you enough risk aversion. Okay? So what we are going to do is we are doing an Epstein's in extension. We keep the elasticity of intertemporal substitution at 1 just because it's simple. It wouldn't matter so much to put it to another value. And uh, then you have this nice utility recursion here. You can solve the model exactly the same way, plus more compu uh, computational um, challenges. You can, can solve almost the same way with that utility function. And um, that is helpful to generate more realistic sharp ratios, so prices of risk. So that's the first thing we do. Then let me just repeat what Marcus already said. So we are going to have this process for stochastic volatility for the idiosyncratic risk. And um, just to point that out again, because there was this question, so this is a cox ingersoll ross process for the variance. It has the square root of the variance here. And that, that feature ensures that you can show mathematically that it always stays positive. Okay? So this thing is always going to stay positive. 
And in fact, it also has the feature whether that's realistic or not. It looks realistic from, from the data we are using, but ultimately we don't have so much evidence. It also has this feature that effectively the variance is higher when idiosyncratic risk is already large. But I believe you would probably get this almost out of any model that has the feature that is bounded below at zero. Then what we are doing, Mark has always said in the recession, idiosyncratic risk goes up and uh, in a recession output also goes down. We want also consumption to go down. So we are simply imposing this. So we don't have a big micro foundation in this model. We are simply imposing that the capital productivity is a function. So we don't want to add an extra state variable. So we just have this one state variable. And we're imposing capital productivity as a function of, oh, there's something missing here. But um, OK, as a function of your idiosyncratic risk process. OK, and what's missing is that there's a bracket minus the steady state value. So then this one is the steady state productivity, and alpha is the sensitivity to, to sigma tilde, how it moves. So this is the same down here. So there's missing minus, then the sigma tilde is 0. So that's what we are imposing. Then you have this, if this is downward sloping, that means risk goes up. Output goes down. You could micro found that there's a paper by the Teller Hall that has labor inside and labor is risky. You could also micro found that with sticky prices. That's another paper I have with, with Sang Lee, a um, PhD student here um, at Princeton. And then you would get this feature endogenously. We are just imposing it. Then we are imposing that the government spends a fixed amount of resources relative to capital each period. Now, why are we, are we making this fixed and not varying with the state? It's mainly because in the data, government purchases, so this is government spending that is part of GDP, has actually tended to be more pro-cyclical in the early post-war period and then tended to be more counter-cyclical lately. And we just don't want to assume either. So we are just making it fixed relative to capital makes it, makes, makes it slightly pro-cyclical. But ultimately, this is not going to matter too much because what matters for bond valuation is the primary surpluses. Okay? And most of what, what moves in surpluses, in recessions, is taxes and transfer payments. And that's not in the G that is a component of GDP, because these are transfers across different people. That's redistribution. OK, then we have this government policy, this bubble mining. So this, oh, this was this bond growth and access of interest payments. So through the government budget constraint, that's related negatively to the primary surpluses. And we're going to make the assumption in line with the data that that also moves over the cycle and is going to be positively related to sigma tilde. So in recessions, it goes up, meaning in recessions, primary surpluses go down. Okay? And these objects here, those four, are, and also these um, three here, are all going to be model parameters, this one, two, that we have to pick. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Question? So, so this It never goes up when the using credit goes, goes up. So is it possible? So, so in here, it's like the productivity. Oh, um, you mean there's no um, productivity growth? Yes. Well, so this, is, so this is an AK model. And you can always, if you had productivity growth, you could always write it as capital growth. So the capital stock is growing continuously. So the economy gets, grows uh, more and more because AK is an endogenous growth type model. And you could always, if you had productivity growth, you could always relabel the capital and measure it in efficiency units in a way to keep the A stationary. So that's not really so restrictive. Um, I'm thinking about, so um, say like during the 70s, uh, like I mean, you could, you could of course say that, that, that um, possibly there is some, some change, some technical change that has nothing to do with capital investment and then it's not well captured by the model. We are abstracting from this stuff. So it could be, yes. But uh, so th this, is, this is still a very stylized model. And you'll nevertheless see it kind of generates not too bad numbers. You can always add more stuff to it. Okay? You can always add more stuff to it and then discipline it with more moments if that's, that's the exercise you want to do. But what we, are, we want to do is, we don't want to give you the best quantitative macro model out there. We just want to show you that if you confront this model that Marcus showed you with some data, then it doesn't fail miserably, but actually it generates quite some, some good asset pricing implications because that's what we're really caring about. Okay, 
So how do we calibrate that idiosyncratic risk process? That there we basically we t calibrate that externally, and we tie our hands. We don't really look at the model. We're just looking at this idiosyncratic risk process and find a data counterpart. So what's the data, data counterpart? We had to look a bit. So there are some measures of idiosyncratic risk. So if you literally think about a model, it's like a productivity. I mean, it's a capital shock, but you could think about it as a type of idiosyncratic productivity shock. There's some literature on this. There's some papers by Bloom and others that have looked at that type of data. You could also think about idiosyncratic risk as, as something else, um, as, as uncertainty about cash flows. There, there are some people that, that try to um, find data on that. But ultimately, all this data has some problem with measurement error and not very long time series and things like that. So what we in the end decided, at least for the new version of the paper, is that we go with data that comes from the stock market. Because the good thing about the stock market is we observe it for a very long time, and we have fairly high quality data. So there's this paper by these four, co a few, these four authors that measures the common idiosyncratic volatility in stock returns. So they're looking at stock returns, they estimate a factor model, they look at the residuals, and they say, is that variance in the residuals, is there a common component? And they find a common component, and they find this is a price risk factor. So if you sort portfolios by how, how much they load on this factor, then you'll actually earn a, then you'll actually see different risk premia for these different portfolios. And they also find this common idiosyncratic risk of volatility, that's why it's V, is correlated with cash flow risk of firms, and they have some suggestive or a bit of evidence that it's also correlated with household consumption risk. So it's a, it's a fairly high quality measure in terms of measurement because it comes from the stock market, and it seems to be capturing all what we, what, what, what we want. It captures cash flow risk of firms, but it also cash, captures consumption risk, which is important for the risk premium, right? And it's priced in reality. And actually, what's even nicer is if you think about their procedure, how they measure it, and you think, how would that, that measurement look like if we were to measure the same thing in our model, generate data from our model theoretically, and measure that same procedure, actually would be exactly that. So sigma tilde is actually the common idiosyncratic volatility in stock returns in our model. So in that sense, it's also a model consistent estimate. Given that, we are simply estim estimating our risk process to match that data series from their paper using a maximum likelihood estimation. Yes? Isn't the idiosyncratic risk in your model not priced in the equity that's held in these mutual funds? It's only well, no, it is because of, because of the cyclicality of the insider premium. Right? So that, that is one reason why the, why, why the beta of the equity is positive. So there is one thing where it doesn't fully match. They say there is something here that's independent of the aggregate market return. We only have one risk factor, so that factor is going to be the same as the aggregate market return. But you could fix that by adding more noise that's not related to idiosyncratic risk. Okay? So that's what we are doing. We are um, estimating a maximum likelihood on that data series that is our proxy for idiosync the idiosyncratic risk process. And that's going to pin down these three parameters of idi our idiosyncratic risk process. And that could possibly fail miserably because we haven't used any information about the model to discipline that process. So what, what next? Chi. Chi was this variable that measures how much residual idiosyncratic risk is there left in, in these individual insider holdings. So how much is diversifiable and how much is left? And that's a bit harder to calibrate because how do you measure it? So you could look at um, portfolios and then depending on what you're looking at, you can come to different numbers. So there's this paper by Angeletos, who has also in um, idiosyncratic capital returns. And um, he says, well, let's just look at the share between private equity and, um, and total equity, I believe. But I, I don't remember exactly the details, but it was something like that. And he said, ah, it's around a half. So he used something like a half for his mod. So that would be one value. There's a bunch of papers from Heaton and Lucas that look at wealth of US stockholders. And when you look at their papers, you would come up with numbers depending on what you quanti qualify as wealth that's subject to idiosyncratic risk. If it's only business wealth, it's more 20%. If it includes real estate wealth, which is also idiosyncratically risky, it's not literally in a model, but you could have a bit more uh, wider interpretation of what capital is, it, you would get these larger numbers of 0 0.5, 0.6. Okay? And then there's some avid, more uh, recent evidence that's not from the US, from Scandinavian administrative data that at least for the very rich guys, which are, again, the ones that hold most of the wealth that's priced in the asset market, 
seem also to suggest that there is a bit of um, kind of private equity holdings, real estate holdings, and other stuff that probably has idiosyncratic risk. So we are just picking some intermediate number. So there's, it's not too sophisticated. It's just something that's somewhat linked to the, to the literature. OK, and here that slide hasn't been finished. So I will just explain it from you, to you um, on the table. So for the remaining parameters, we have a whole bunch of parameters left. We do moment matching. And uh, let me explain you why, why that's not so a bad idea. OK, so here is a bunch of moments. So this is basically more standard business cycle moments, like the volatility of output, of consumption relative to output, investment relative to output, uh, primary surpluses, normalized by output to make it um, better behaved, uh, some correlations, but the correlations we are not matching. It's our model is a bit too, too primitive for that because we have just one risk factor. So all correlations will be 0.99. Uh, and then there are a bunch of means for aggregates relative to output, except for that one that we take from some paper from microdata. Um, and then some, um, some other means of uh, the capital to output ratio and the debt to output ratio. And then there are some asset pricing moments. So let me go step by step and explain which moments are pinned down, which, which parameters are pinned down by which moments effectively. So first of all, we are making a bit of an assumption here. So we are looking at the average capital output ratio in the US. It's about um, 3.7 in our sample. And our assumption here is, well, total wealth is basically either capital wealth or, um, or um, bond wealth. Okay? So that's consistent with the model, but in reality, it's not so clear. And the other assumption is basically the only net safe asset after we have accounted for the CHI is the government bond, because we are thinking about this CHI as all the equity and so on, these are also claims to capital. If that's correctly calibrated, then all these claims to capital, or what the financial sector does, or what the financial markets do to diversify, that's already somehow um, correctly reflected. And um, of course, that's, that, that's a big of a leap. So um, anyway, these are the numbers that we get for these two wealth components relative to GDP. A oh no, this is the data. And in, in if actually over the sample, the debt to GDP ratio in the US is much smaller, it's 30%. But in recent, in, so we just take the last 20 years. Why do we do that? Because uh, it has risen so much that it seems not reflective of current times anymore to go with 30%. So once we have these two wealth components, if we believe in these numbers, we effectively have this theta, this portfolio share that Marcus talked about a lot, or this relative price. So at least on average. Okay? And once we have the theta, we can basically plug everything in into other equations. And we get something like a closed form solution condition on theta. And that will help us a lot in expressing what is the consumption to output ratio, the spending to output ratio. OK, these di directly come off. You know, this comes out of our rules. The investment uh, rate, the surplus to output ratio. What are these things um, in our steady state, at least? So in steady state, we can ex express them conditional on getting the theta right. We can express all these variables. And then we can map them to parameters. And now I'm, I have to think about it again. So um, forget about this one, um, because I haven't introduced something. But this is basically our G parameter, our, our government spending um, parameter directly. Um, the consumption to output ratio is, once that's um, satisfied, um, that is related to our capital productivity. So basically what happens in an AK model is that that you're taking a certain amount given your raw, and you're investing that, and the rest you're consuming. And no, I think it's the opposite. But anyway, so in, in the end, a raw and, and, um, and the investment rate, they are somehow pinned down by this one and this one. So here it's, a, it's my problem of not having the slides, so I forget the things. The average consumption to output ratio, that's basically um, directly mapping into this guy here and our policy parameter. So because from through the government budget constraint, what you do in steady or in average in bubble mining is related to your average surplus. Okay? So this is directly related to this guy here. So these averages give us basically this parameter, this parameter, this parameter, this parameter. These four here we have already pinned down through uh, looking at other data unrelated to the model. So what's left is the risk aversion and that sensitivity of, of, um, of productivity to idiosyncratic risk, the sensitivity of 
policy to idiosyncratic risk, the capital adjustment parameter, and forget about these two because they will not really matter. Okay? So the sensitivity of the capital adjustment cost, a question, yeah? Let me defer that question. It's a very good question. And it actually relates to something that Marcus skipped and said I will talk about. Let me defer it. I come to the risk aversion last. Okay? But it's a, it's a very good question because our risk aversion, I haven't talked about the numbers yet. I will do that. It's not that large. Okay? But let's first talk about the others. So the capital adjustment cost, remember this Tobin's Q equation that Marcus showed. That's basically, that equation shows you how much of the variation in kind of, um, in changes in investment opportunities go through actual capital investment and how much of them go through the capital price. And if this is higher, this phi, then more of the variation in investment opportunities works through the capital price. But that means they work through consumption because a higher capital price generates a wealth effect and you are going to consume more. So basically this capital adjustment cost is going to, so we, we haven't really found good mic microdata estimates on this, also because in the microdata it looks like these, uh, these, um, these uh, convex costs are not that good. So we are just using that to discipline the relative volatility of consumption versus investment. So if you, if you drive it to infinity, then all the co volatility of output will be consumption volatility because there is no investment left. Whereas if you drive it to zero, then um, you're reacting a lot on the investment margin where the investment opportunities ch change. And how do you do that? By cutting back consumption. Okay? So um, that's why basically you can control with this parameter how much of the volatility of output goes into consumption and how much goes into investment. And you see we broadly match those. Okay, this, this, product, this uh, parameter uh, of how much does output vary with idiosyncratic risk, that directly controls the volatility of output. Okay, but it's almost exogenous, up to a small endogenous growth rate. That parameter, how much policy varies with the idiosyncratic risk, that controls the volatility of the primary surpluses because that policy parameter is tightly related to the primary surpluses. So that we basically can use to, to, to match that thing. And then really the only thing is that's left is the gamma. Okay? And here we have to be lucky because the gamma needs to give us these two ratios about right and it needs to match the equity stuff. So here it's almost like it's, 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 not, it's all targets in a sense, but uh, you could almost think about the equity premium and so on as an untarget at the moment because it's really the gamma that, that gives you the ratio of those two and that gives you those two numbers, right? And you see, uh, I was actually surprised how good a job the model does. So I, I uh, checked the code a couple of times because I thought this is not right. But uh, it, it actually works pretty good. So we're getting an, so we, we are matching the unlevered equity premium, okay, because there's no leverage in the model. So there we make a small assumption on leverage. So you could say we have cheated here a bit. But in the, in the end, you can, it's not complete degree of freedom. So you have to do something on leverage that's uh, around right. So therefore, um, we match the equity premium. We match a sharp ratio, so we have at least some confidence in that this mo model gives us some reasonable aggregate risk pricing. We can talk about the idiosyncratic risk pricing, but the hope is that if the preferences are not completely misspecified, those two should be related. Right? So now, regarding the parameters, I'm not talking about most of those, but the risk aversion is only six, okay? And that's not a lot if you go to the long-run risk literature, if you go to literatures that try to quantify this Constantini, this stuffy stuff that's very close to ours where you have idiosyncratic risk. So one reason that gives you a big boost is that you have this flight to safety. So let me go quite a bit back. Where was it, Marcus? Is it further? Yeah. This, is it this one? No. This one it is. Okay. So you have a feature in this model that is missing in most asset pricing models. In most asset pricing models, Cap, basically all output is generated by capital. Possibly there's labor, but usually there's a constant labor share, so that a constant fraction of output each period goes to capital. So the value of capital is basically the present value of a constant fraction of output. That's what you have in most asset pricing models out there. And that means that 
when the value of cap, so the, that would be something like a like an aggregate kind of budget constraint. The value of capital is possibly with an alpha if you have labor is the present value of all future output consumption. Okay, so that means if consumption or output is not varying a lot, then you need a lot of variation in the stochastic discount factor to make the capital price moving or the, the equity price is identified with the capital price. Now in this model, we have capital and we have bonds and both are net wealth. So you can have movements between those two even if this thing is completely constant. Okay? So that means that you will have volatility between those two objects because this is negative beta, this is positive beta, that is stronger than the volatility of this object here. And therefore we need not so much stochastic discount factor variation as in other models where all the net wealth comes from the capital. So that, that's a basic intuition. So how important is that? And unfortunately, these are the numbers based on the old calibration, but I have briefly looked at them. I don't think it changes, changes a lot. I mean, the exact numbers are going to change, but the, um, the, the proportion are probably fairly similar. So given that we do have a quantitative model, we can actually look at how much kick do we get from this flight to safety from Kaplan to bonds and bad times in terms of equity volatility or here capital return volatility? And the answer is quite a bit. How do we do that? We take the same model, same parameters, one change. We're kind of selecting an equilibrium where bonds have no value. Okay? And then the surplus is also zero. So um, we're taking an, an equilibrium where bonds have no value and the surplus is zero. And then you're going back to the case where this is zero at all times and the value of capital is equal to the present value of future consumption discounted with this, with this uh, Xi double star F SDF. And in that case, in the old calibration, you would get 2.9% equity return volatility and also a considerably lower risk premium. Whereas in our model where you have this flight to safety compo co component on top of it, you get actually 12.9% in the old calibration. So this gives you quite a bit of a boost, and that is one of the reasons why our risk aversion that we need is much smaller than in typical calibrations of models that only have capital, because we have this additional feature, this trade between the two assets. Okay, and I think I'm basically out of time, so let's not talk about this more. Um, but if you have any comments on, on the calibration, I'm very curious to hear them, because there is still, I guess, some room for improvement, even though the numbers look pretty good, so I actually don't want to touch them too much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs>